Acts the 27th chapter, verse 20 through 26 says, When neither sun nor stars appeared for many days and the storm continued raging, we finally gave up all hope of being saved. It's a helpless and a bad place when you're hopeless. I don't know how many people have been pushed to the brink of hopelessness, but it is a really dark season. When you no longer have an idea, a thought, an inkling of heart to think that you are ever going to be able to be better than you are right now. That's a hopeless moment. And in verse 21, after they had gone a long time without food, Paul stood up. And he stood up before them and said, men, you should have taken my advice not to sail from Crete. In other words, he gave them a real great big, I told y'all. Then you would have spared yourselves the damage and the loss. But now I urge you to keep up your courage because not one of you will be lost. Thank you, Holy Ghost. Only the ship will be destroyed. Last night, an angel of the Lord, angel of God to whom I belong and whom I serve, stood beside me. And let me tell you what he said. He says, do not be afraid, Paul. Chill out. I got this. You must stand trial before Caesar. Still got work for you to do. And God graciously has given you the lives of all who sail with you. So not just you, but God says he's going to save everybody on the boat. Tell your neighbor he's going to save you too. Not just my house, but your house. Not just my family, but your family. Not just my kids, but your kids. Yeah. So keep your courage. For I have faith in God that it will happen just as he has told me. Nevertheless, we must run aground on some island. Lord, I need preaching power. I need the anointing of the Holy Spirit to take under and complete control of me, my life, my members, that you might be glorified in this moment and that I might serve you. I need your help. I can't preach without you. I can't move without you. So stand up in me. That the anointing of the Holy Spirit will take complete and utter control and give me a grace that makes preaching easy and listening even easier. And at the end of it all, I promise you, I'm going to turn around and tell you, thank you. Because I shall not take from your glory. I shall only give glory and honor unto you. Thank you for what you are about to do. In us, with us, to us, for us, and through us. In the name that can, that shall, and that will. Let the redeemed of the Lord shout hallelujah and amen. You may be seated in the incredible, awesome, magnificent, marvelous presence of our God, of our God. Those of you who are joining us, I had to take a pause for the cause of celebrating our mothers last week, which was an incredible opportunity. And I don't know about you, but I enjoyed my Mother's Day with my mother and my wife. If you enjoyed yours, just celebrate your mom again on today. Amen. And I recognize that some of you celebrated your mom in her presence and some in her absence. But nonetheless, it is definitely a blessing and a benefit that all of us have been afforded in this life and lifetime that we have a mother whom we can celebrate. Amen. 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 So I did stop our series just to make sure that I was able to honor them uh, with a moment of celebration. But I want to jump right back into it. And those of you who were not here the week before last, and you may be just catching up with us, I did begin the series Unshakable. And it is my responsibility in the time that God has afforded me to begin the process of unpacking, unfolding, and enlightening you on what strategies we can learn and glean, how we can grow in our faith to the point that we're able to say beyond a shadow of a doubt that we are unshakable. Let, let's practice for a few moments. If you, if you really believe that you have enough faith and you're confident that your God is your God and that he's a keeper, sustainer, provider, protector, that he's a covering, that he's a shield, a guard, a guide, that he's the one that can literally push you into the presence of, of, of his glory and cause all the breath of your promise to be fulfilled, then I want you to say this with great confidence. I want you to say it with vigor and vitality. I want it to be an exuberant expression. I need you to say, I am unshakable. Now this time, that was for her. This was just a rehearsal. When we get to heaven, we're going to really sing. So I want you to do it this time more emphatically, but this time you're going to say it to somebody. And you got to say it in a way that causes them to believe that you mean what you're saying. Come on, somebody. Now, if they say it weak, then they're not really unshakable. 
Turn to your neighbor and say, neighbor, I am unshakable. Unshakable, unshakable, unshakable. Now, some of you would conclude that this might feel like a, a sign of your mind slipping or that it might appear that you are losing yourself or losing your mind, but uh, I'm going to teach you that sometimes you just got to talk to yourself. Maybe your neighbor don't want to listen to you. Maybe their breath stink. Maybe you just don't want to talk to them no more. But whatever it is, this is your chance to get yourself together. So I need you to talk to yourself with emphasis. Say, self, self. I am unshakable. I am unshakable. I am unshakable. Now, you've got to be careful about making that prophetic declaration or the divine declaration over your own life. You've got to be careful because uh, most people who make that definitive uh, statement, most people who are emphatic the way that you just were, most people who say that with such definitive nature and with confidence, they really have not realized the, the, the conclusion of that matter. In order for you to know that you are anything, you have to go through through a moment of testing. Let me give you an example. When you are in grade school, in order for them to know whether or not you are competent and qualified to pass from grade to grade to grade, they have to take you through a series of assessment or of tests. In order to pass you from grade school to middle school, they have to give you a final exam and make sure that you're competent and qualified at that level before they can promote you and elevate you to the next level. Before they promote you from junior or middle high, middle school or junior high, they have to, before they put you in high school, they have to to take you through a level of testing so it is the same thing with God in order for God to know whether or not you really have grown to the point where you are unshakable he has to release some storms to come into your life all right, I'm, this is not going to be fun for some of y'all. I see that. Brace yourself. Just tell your neighbor, brace yourself. Brace yourself because he's going to be talking about you today. Yeah, he has to let you go through some storms to see whether or not your faith is really faith. Because faith is not really faith until it has been tested. And testing is not easy. Anybody remember the nights you had to stay up studying for a test? Anybody remember the feeling and the anxiety that you had right before the test? Anybody remember the wait just to see what your grade is on the test? Anybody remember that testing took a lot of work? It took a lot of concentration. When you got to the point of the final exam, you had to really put in a lot of work, a lot of energy, a lot of effort. You couldn't play with it. You stayed up all night long. You studied. You read. And then you wondered, did I study the right thing? Did I do the right thing on the test? Did I remember to do this? this did I remember to do that then you had to wait for your results to come the anxiety was there you're wondering am I gonna pass am I gonna fail did I make it okay I see right now some of y'all act like y'all ain't been in school don't worry about it don't worry about it I got y'all don't worry about it I told y'all this is the ghetto pastor smoking off of the day don't worry about it I said don't worry about it don't worry about it I got y'all don't worry about it some of y'all remember that other test you know the test that you had to go in the bathroom close the door lock the door behind you Oh, so y'all gonna play like y'all don't know what I'm talking about. You trying to see if you got a minus sign or a plus sign in the, in the little window? Oh, okay, some of y'all, all right, some of y'all say, don't worry about it, don't worry about it. Some of y'all still want to act like you want to act like you want to act like you want to act like. That's cool. I got y'all. You remember that other test. You know that other test, that other test where they swabbed your mouth, sent it off to, and you had that good wait and see if you have, if all of your fun is going to lead to your failure. I need you to give him that side eye. You know that emoji on the phone. Give him that side eye. Just look up over here to the side like, you know he's talking to you. I don't know why you're fronting up in here. Remember when you called me talking about some girl? I don't know what I'm about now. God has to allow some storms to come into our life so he can test us to see whether or not our faith has been qualified for promotion. And so it's one thing I can stand here all day long and say, I am unshakable. I am unshakable. I am unshakable. But God will allow storms and tests and trials and problems and, and tribulation to enter my life so that I, he will know whether or not I am really unshakable. So you got to be careful about making that divine declaration over your life because you, the moment that you make that declaration, God says, all right, let's see. Let me release some storms. Now watch this. It is not God who releases anything to harm you. It is not God that does things to hurt you. It is the, it is the dastardly devil that does those things to you. 
And how do you know that, Pastor? Because Jeremiah 29, 11 gives me confidence and assurance that God didn't really come to harm me. He says, for I know the thoughts I have for you, says the Lord. Not to harm you, but to prosper you. To give you a hope and even make sure that you've got a future. So it's not the Lord that releases trouble and trial to harm you, but God will sometimes allow things to come into your life to test you and push you into the full breadth of your promise and potential. Are you with me? And he'll know that you're unshakable when you learn how to thank God in the middle of your storm. Yeah. The clouds will get dark, billows may roll, but you are still shouting and dancing and praising God. L let me just, can I just go on and tell you what I see in the spirit? Some of y'all are really unshakable. Some of y'all are faking it, but don't worry about it. We're going to get you there before the sermon is over. But some of y'all are really unshakable because you got everything that could go wrong going wrong in your life right now, but you rolled out of the bed, put your clothes on, scooted to the car, crawled and cried all the way here came in the sanctuary nobody had to push you or remind you to bless God but you entered into his gates with thanksgiving and into his courts with praise you've been worshiping harder than your whole row the whole service that nobody even knows the hell you dealing with behind closed door so I know some of you are really unshakable See, God is an if-then kind of God. It's, it's, it's not whether or not if you're going to go through a storm. You will go through a storm. It's coming. I don't care who you are. I don't care what your name is, how saved you are, how fire baptized, how sanctified you are. If you are breathing, if you are alive, if you are in this world, you're going to go through a storm. Every portion of your life will be filled with seasons of trial and testing and storms that arise in your life. I don't care who you are from the time of your conception to the time of your birth. You have been enduring a storm. Just think about it. When you are in your mother's womb, the child is now in the comforts of his mother's womb. For nine months, your world is peaceable. Your world is, is completely provided for sustenance. You don't have to work for it. You don't have to ask for it. You don't have to do anything. It just appears. It just funnels through the system of the, of the, of the, of the host of the mother's womb. And it, it produces what is necessary in order for you to continue to grow. You're surrounded by fluids and liquids which feel like a pillow of peace. You're floating on a, a pillow of nothingness it's a blissful moment it's a it's a moment of it, it's dark and it's comfortable and and, and 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 to give you confidence and assurance that you're not by yourself you continue to get the small murmur of the heartbeat of the mom and you continue to hear that at all times and even the voice of your mother and the voice of those who are around her they soothe you because you know that you're in a familiar place and for all practical purposes for nine months you are in a blissful state you don't have to worry about nothing, ask for nothing, work for nothing. You are just chilling. And everything that you need is here. And then one day, one day the pillow leaves. There's a violent eruption. Now all of a sudden there is, there's the chaos of contractions that are pushing on you and your, and, and your head is being compressed. And finally the, your, your whole world, including your physical being, is turned upside down. Your whole world as you thought it was, your whole world as you knew it, is turned upside down. And then you enter into the birthing canal. You hear the screams and you hear the loud noise and you feel the contractions of the muscles pushing you downward. You feel all of this violence now erupting and it seems like your world is coming to an end. And then all of a sudden you're pushed out into the world. Your head is compressed in the process. And congratulations, you were just born. And so the pain of the birthing moment, the mother, has, the mother has to go through pain and turmoil and trouble to try to birth you. You've experienced the world of trouble in the birthing process. And your daddy goes through the birthing trouble of trying to pay for it all. <laughs> Amen. From the moment of your birth, you have been experiencing storms and trouble. It's not a matter of if you're going to go through a storm. It's when it comes, how will you handle it? 
There are several different types of storms. There's the ones that we know about, like, you know, hurricanes. You see the predictions on, on the news. They start saying, brace yourself, batten down the hatches. It's coming. Snowstorms. Come on, we live in the Midwest. We know. We, uh, give us an announcement and say, hey, it's going to be a snowstorm. It's going gonna, it's gonna to snow at 4 o'clock p.m. There's the ones that you know are coming, the thunderstorms. You know they're coming. Then there's the ones that you don't see. Tornadoes, earthquakes. You don't even see those storms coming. Sometimes storms can hit your life and you don't know where it came from. Which, which direction did this come from? It can discombobulate you to the extent that you don't even know whether you're up or down, going or coming. What, what just happened? One day everything was good, the sun was shining, and all of a sudden now the darkness has hit and a tornado has rolled through and ransacked everything in my life. What just happened? Anybody ever had that kind of storm? And then there's the ones that you can't even do anything about, like firestorms. It's at the mercy of the wind. Whichever way the wind blows, that's the way that the fire's going. And they spend months and months and months trying to at least just contain it because they can't really fully squelch it or put it out. Or perhaps the new one that I've just noticed and I hadn't even given it thought. You got whole islands being ransacked by volcanoes. Where the molten lava of the earth's core is now heated to the point that it's now separating the earth's crust and it's spewing out into the atmosphere. You've got volcanoes that you can do nothing with and it's burning and melting and disintegrating everything in its sight. You, you can't do anything with it. There are some storms that hit you, that they hit you so hard you don't even know how you're going to be able to fix it. Anybody been in those storms? Some of you perhaps been in storms and you didn't even realize that you were in the storm, but maybe it didn't look like the molten lava, maybe it didn't look like the earthquake or the tornado or the thunderstorm or the snowstorm, but, uh, but, but perhaps it, it was that when you, you, you've been working on a job for 30 years and then all of a sudden they come in and tell you right before it's time for retirement, they're going to let you go. Maybe your storm didn't look like that. Maybe your storm was that everything in your, in, your, in your life that can support and encourage you and your spouse, you've done everything that you can to be a support, to be an encouragement, and then all of a sudden, right, right before you celebrate an anniversary, they announce their departure. Maybe there are storms that look like that. Or maybe you finally get the peace and stability in your life and everything looks like it's, it's on smooth sailing, it's on autopilot. You finally got to a place where you feel like, okay, God, my life is in a phenomenal place. Thank you. The season of darkness is over. You go to the doctor for a regular checkup and the diagnosis turns your entire world upside down. Or perhaps you've done everything that you know how to do. You've been, you've been feverishly working and, and, and tirelessly trying to make sure that your children become the best people that they could possibly be. You've provided them with every resource, every access, every opportunity, all the love, everything that you have to give. But they still keep making decisions that keep you up at night. Everybody has some storms. From the preacher to the pew. It's not one of us that does not have our life attacked because trouble is going to happen. Here's the guarantee that it's going to happen. The Bible says it this way. In this life, you shall have tribulation. The enemy is going to put you through turmoil. Storms are going to be released into your life because God has to allow them so that he can equip you to handle where he's about to take you. So the only reason the storms are coming at you so hard is because the next level requires enough strength to be resilient, powerful, and strong enough to carry the weight of the glory that he's about to restore, bestow upon your life. Here's what I don't want you to miss. Favor is heavy. You can't carry favor if you got weak legs. What you mean by weak legs? If you got a weak prayer life, then you can't fa carry favor. If you don't know the word of God, you ain't going to be able to handle the favor that God wants to put on your life. If you don't have a relationship with him, if you don't know how to worship God, if you don't get over yourself and learn how to get in his presence, if you don't know how to humble yourself before God, then you can't carry the weight of his favor. If he puts his favor on you and your legs aren't strong enough to handle it, you will die under the weight of the pressure. And so he has to allow the storms to come so that you'll be equipped and ready so that he can be competent and confident that if I put this on you, you're not going to die under the weight of the pressure. Why do you think he allowed the storm? Because your prayer life went to another level. You ain't never prayed like you've been praying. I ain't seen you in church this much in the last 10 years that we've been in existence. But in this season that the storm hits your life, I see you every Sunday. You sit in the same place every single Sunday. And you're here on time and you're praying the whole time. 
Sometimes he allows it to happen because he needs to push you in there. Because if you don't have the prayer life that's necessary at this level, when you get to the next level, new levels produce new devils. So the attacks that you're going to experience on the next level, if you can't handle it here, it's going to wipe you out up there. Are y'all with me? Please encourage your neighbor and say, neighbor, he's just getting you ready for it. It's already ready for you. I'm just trying to help you understand. It's already prepared. He's already set it up. It's already in the atmosphere of the heavenlies. It just not, it's just not manifested in the earthly realm. God is waiting on you to be prepared. And he's waiting on his Kairos and Kronos to align so that he can manifest it in your now. It's already in your then. It's just not in your now. Y'all missed it. I'm going to try it one more time. You saw it in your yesterday, but it's now you can't experience it in your now, but it's already in your then. What is it then? then? What is it ready for in my then? What do you mean in my then? I'm means simply this when you get ready for it then it will be prepared and presented unto you it'll manifest in the earth realm and you'll get the evidence of the confidence that you have exemplified in God okay that went way over somebody's head so let me let me help you out it, it may not come when you want it I, I gotta say like my grandma used to say but when he shows up and presents it to you it's going to be on time Y'all remember that movie? I don't even, I don't even remember the name of it, but this line is so famous. You know, Jack Nichols is that you can't handle the truth. You can't handle the truth. You can't handle the favor. What you've been asking God for, you can't handle it. Lord, I need a new man, and you can't take care of yourself. The Lord gonna bless me. He is when you get ready. He ain't gonna let you jack up somebody else's life because your life ain't right. I'm sorry, that wasn't in my notes. Let me get back to these notes. I don't mean to hurt your feelings, but I'm trying to help you. Asking God for a new job and you're late for this one. And mad because they said something to you. Cause I had something, my car was broke. You know your car was raggedy the night before, you should have got up a little early and just got there. I'm just trying to, I'm trying to help y'all. If you can't say man, just say ouch. Uh, yeah. I want that new car, that fancy car. You see that car right there, it drive itself and everything. I'm gonna get that car, that's my dream car. Well, you're going to be dreaming until you learn how to change the oil on the one that you got. Light been on for three years. I ain't got no money for that. Mm -mm. Pastor North said, I got to pay my tithes. What y'all got going on at 10 o'clock? It's a different anointing in this house. It's a truth serum going on in the atmosphere in here. The Holy Ghost is pulling it on out of me. Here's what you need to know about your trouble, because it's coming. It's coming. Whether you're ready or not, it's coming. Trouble is coming. I know that's alarming. You don't want to hear that. You want somebody to preach a message that says, oh, no, you're a believer in God. Everything's going to be perfectly okay. Well, we know at the end of it, it will be okay. But all things, all things work together for the good of them that love him. Now, that means all things are all good things. But all things that you go through, we know it works for our good because we love him and we're called according to his purpose. So we know that it's going to work in our favor. It's going to come out okay. But before we get to okay, we're going to have to go through trouble. Some of the things you need to know about trouble is trouble doesn't announce itself. Trouble doesn't come to stand around the corner and say, hey, I'm troubled. Here I come. You seen that little commercial mayhem? That Allstate commercial where mayhem is, is down there doing what mayhem wants to do? Well, it don't work like that. Mayhem is working and it's may your mayhem is not a person that's beneath the seat of your car trying to mess up your, your steering and your, and your, and your ability to, to maintain control of your vehicle. Let me tell you what mayhem looks like. Mayhem comes to steal, kill, and destroy. Mayhem looks like the haters on your job nipping at your heels trying to keep you down. Mayhem looks like you, you, your car breaks down, now your refrigerator goes out, and now you gotta, your light bill is overdue. I'm talking about mayhem. Yeah, mayhem is an enemy that roams throughout the land seeking whom he may devour. 
And so please understand that when he comes, he doesn't announce himself. He catches you off guard. And the whole reason that the enemy catches you off guard because he knows if you catch you off guard, you won't be prepared and you, should, you, you might not be braced and ready to handle it with a level of faith that causes you to truly be unshakable. Trouble does not also, it does not always come on at one at a time. Anybody live through the storms where you see that one thing happens and another thing happens? Trouble will hit you so hard it'll hit you back to back. It doesn't wait till this trouble leaves and then, okay, my turn, now I'm going to jump in. No, trouble will be compounded and you'll have trouble on top of trouble, on top of trouble, on top of trouble. Because trouble does not, it is disrespectful. <laughs> trouble is not polite at all. Trouble don't care what your name is. It don't care what your color is. It don't care the way, what house you live in, what side of the street you came up on. It, trouble does not. Trouble is downright disrespectful. Trouble steps to the plate talking about put some respect on it. It's all going to happen. Trouble is coming. Now, here's the catch and here's the key. It's not whether it's coming. It's coming. But the real tell sign as to whether or not you're ready for what God is about to do is how you handle it when it gets there. There's a saying that says the same sun that melts the wax hardens the clay. So it's in the way that you respond to the storms in your life that make all the difference. When people come to the end of their lives and begin to tell their story, it's the storms that often made them great. So what God has taken survey of is how are you handling the storms I released to come into your life? Are you panicking or are you praising? Are you praying or are you complaining? Are you believing or are you doubting? Are you hoping or are you giving up? He wants to know how are you handling the storm? Are you really unshakable? Because if you're not unshakable at this level, you will not be able to handle the next level that I'm going to take you to. The children of Israel wandered in the wilderness for 40 years for what should have been a four-day trip. How long have you been in the woods? How long have you wandered around when really all you needed to do was go across the street? Watch this. The promised land didn't move. <laughs> it was there the whole time. So what happened is God didn't allow them to see it until they were ready to handle it. And there was a whole generation of people that died off because even when he did pull back the curtain and allow the spies to see it. They were so doubtful and they spread doubt throughout the camp that God says, you know what? You're going to have exactly what you said. You've been canceling your own faith and your own potential with your own mouth. So it shall be just like you've spoken it. You're going to die right here in this wilderness and your children and your children's children will be able to see it, but you won't get there. How long you been in the woods? And how long are you going to stay in the woods before God allows you to pull back the curtain and see that God is still God and that what he has in your tomorrow is better than what was in your yesterday? That your latter shall be greater than your former, forgetting the things which are behind me, looking forward to the things which are before me. How long are you going to be in the woods? How long are you going to be in the wilderness and doubt that God is still God? He wants you to get to the point where when you say this, it's not just a colloquial saying. It's not just call and response. It's not just pastor told the church to say this, and so we all said it. But he wants you to say it with such resolve that nobody has to prompt you, nobody push you, nobody reminds you, nobody even has to ask you. But you're able to say it with great vigor, great confidence, with great stability. You're able to say, I am unshakable. And I understand some of you, you you're saying it because of rehearsed uh, a writ or, or saying uh, a responsiveness. I, I know you're saying it just because it's convenient, it's comfortable, it's a thing to do in this atmosphere, but I want to help you out because some of you may not even really understand what it means to be unshakable. So let me give you a literal definition of unshaken. If you're unshaken, which is the equivalent of unshakable, if you're unshaken, you're not disturbed from a firm position or state, you're steadfast and unwavering. To be unshaken is to be steadfast 
and unwavering. Two, two characteristics or two qualities come out of this definition. If you are unshaken by something, you are not emotionally affected by it. In other words, you're able to stay calm. You're able to be composed. You're unbothered. That's how you know when somebody's unshaken. Because they're not emotional about it. They're just unbothered. You, you, you know anybody in life that it doesn't matter what happens, they're the same the whole time. They're unshaken. They're just unbothered. So what God wants to know is, are you going to be an emotional wreck? Or are you going to be unbothered? Can you keep your composure or will you fall apart? You've seen the movies where somebody, uh, so, something happens and somebody loses their head and they're just all over the place and then somebody just grabs them and just says, Psh. <laughs> snap out of it. Are you the person that snaps them out of it or are you the person that needs to be snapped out of it? Are you unbothered? Do you keep your composure? See, you're really not unshaken until you learn how to praise God in the middle of the storm. Yeah, you know somebody kept their composure when everything that the enemy can throw at them hits their life at the same time, but they still manage to show up at church and give God the glory that he deserves. They still manage to roll over and tune in and still worship God, even if they got to do it in their living room, in their sick bed. See, you'll know when you keep your composure by how you handle the, the, the pressures of life when the enemy throws them at you. When storms come, you're not rattled. You're, you're excited because you realize that if God, if this storm is this big, I can't wait to see what you about to do in my next season. Weeping may endure for a night, but good morning, y'all. Joy is about to turn the corner in my life. And if he took me through this, I can't can't wait till what my promotion looks like I'm composed I'm unbothered let me help you understand let me help some of y'all understand this is the way to win the argument I know this is this is going to seem off course for you but I'm gonna I'm bring it in I promise you. You, you, you you've ever had people who are confrontational and contentional in your life there is a way to win the argument here it is. Whenever someone is trying to bring contention, just choose not to participate. When you get ready to talk to me, come back and let's try it again. But your tone, your tone, your... Your tone makes me nervous. So I'm going to choose not to participate in this conversation. I'm going to choose to holler at you when you come to yourself and realize who you're talking to. I am a child of the most high God. And that's the only child I am except for my mom and daddy. And so I need you to come to me a different way. Well, here's the thing. When the enemy comes at you, you can choose not to participate. I choose not to give attention to this distraction, but I choose to lift up my eyes to the hills from whence come in my help and bless the Lord at all times. Let his praises continually be in my mouth. I choose not to argue with the devil, but I choose to praise God for what he's about to do in my life. I refuse to participate in the devil's antics, but I'm going to keep my composure and I'm going to still be a worshiper when all hell is breaking loose in my life I choose not to participate I promise you you will win every time you ever want to make the devil man just praise God anyhow see y'all know that's that's down south kind of talk I know y'all don't know, know that about here you city slickers you so educated that y'all don't understand what that means but when you learn how to praise God anyhow that means I don't care what's going on I'm gonna praise him anyhow i'm gonna praise him in spite of i'm gonna praise him in the middle of it i'm gonna praise him because of i'm gonna praise him anyhow any anyhow praises up in here anybody learn how to give them an anyhow praise i don't have the money that i need the enemy has attacked my finances my money is funny my finances are fickle and my pains are few but i'm gonna bless god 
Oh, come on, I got a few of y'all up in here. The devil looked at me and thought that he was going to take me out. He thought I would have been crazy by now. But I figured out that my key, my source, my strength is to bless God. You got to learn how to praise him. Anyhow. I'm going to praise him anyhow. I'm sick in my body, but I'm going to praise him anyhow. I don't understand how he's going to bring me through this season, but I'm going to praise him anyhow. I ain't got a whole lot of strength to give him a whole lot of dance, but I'm going to give him what I got. I'm going to praise him anyhow. You might think that I'm out the game. You might have counted me out, but I'm going to bless God. Anyhow, you will win every single time if you can just keep your composure. If you can keep your wits about you, if you can keep your worship on you, if you can keep the praises of God in your heart and in your mouth, if you, if you can, you, you got to be like the singer saints. I woke up this morning with my mind and it wasn't on my bills. It wasn't on my job. It wasn't on the haters on my job. It wasn't on my boss. It wasn't on my problems. It wasn't on my pain. It wasn't on my arthritis. It wasn't on my kids. It wasn't on my way with spouse. It wasn't on, when I woke up this morning, I had my mind and I just said, God, I want to keep my mind stayed on. See. It's not real deep. It's just scriptural. Because the Bible says, if I can keep my mind on him, thou who keeps his mind on me, I shall keep them in perfect peace. Y'all missed it. Not just peace. See, having a little money in your bank account gives you peace. Having friends that are on your side and in your corner gives you peace. But anybody that's lived long enough to say, that knows that friends will change with the weather, that money comes, but there's one thing that always remains the same yesterday, today, and forevermore. So when God gives you peace, it's perfect peace. That means it's unwavering, unchanging. It's always accessible, always available. It never leaves. It never goes away. It never retires. It never expires. God will keep you in perfect. If you just learn how to keep your mind. How do you praise when you're going through hell because my mind ain't on it? How do you make it when you walk there, walking in the middle of the water and don't look like you got walls on, no help. It's because my mind ain't on the water. How do you make it when you don't know how in the world you're going to be able to pull this thing off and get this thing together? Because my mind ain't on pulling it off. My mind is on, on Jesus. I ain't got to pull it off. He's going to pull it off. I ain't got to make it. He's going to make it. I ain't got to figure it out. He done already figured it out. I ain't got to worry about it. Me and God both don't need to be up at night. He never sleeps nor slumbers. One of us got to get some sleep. Tell your neighbor, keep your composure. No, 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 you got to say it real sophisticated. Keep your composure. Listen, watch this. There was a man in the supermarket pushing a cart and it contained, among a whole lot of other groceries and other things, a screaming baby. Y'all seen it. You know, they got the baby tied down for dear life. And the baby, like, ah. As the man was proceeding through the aisles, there was a woman who was watching him, and she was really concerned. I'm sure she wanted to jump in. You know, that motherly instinct come, kicks in. And y'all just have this thing. It's like, ooh, 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 ooh. Daddies, we got it, too, because as soon as we hit the brakes in the car, we... So, so, well, I should say, the, the newer daddies may not, the older daddies, because we didn't have seat belts. We just, we just flew through the window. <laughs> Baby sitting on the armrest. Hey, daddy. <laughs> I remember playing with my daddy's beard while he was driving down the expressway. <laughs> Thank you, Lord. Grace and mercy kept us. Going through the aisle, the baby hollering. He pushing the cart, and she overheard him. She's like, "Oh, what is he saying?" He says, "Keep calm, George. Keep calm. Keep calm. Don't get excited. Don't get excited, George. Just keep calm." Well, you, you know, some parents talk to their children like that. <laughs> I 
I do. Don't get excited, Trey. Don't get excited. Don't get excited, George. Don't, don't, don't yell, George. George, don't yell. Keep calm. Well, the lady who was watching, she finally got enough courage. She came over. She says, listen, you are to be commended for your patience. I am so in awe of your patience with your baby. She says, the way that you are raising little George, he shall surely come out to be phenomenal. He says, ma'am, I'm George. I had to talk to myself to keep from choking the life out this little boy. Sometimes to keep your composure, you're going to have to learn to talk to yourself. Smoke it, don't cuss, not right now. Smoke it, don't say nothing. Smoke it, walk away. Smoke it, don't yell. Smoke it, choose not to participate. Smoke it. Tell your neighbor, keep calm. Y'all got me preaching so good, I ain't even going to finish this sermon today. Y'all must have came with dry wood. Y'all want a fire to burn up in this place. The other thing, if your beliefs are unshaken, not only will you keep your composure, but you will keep your confidence. And your confidence in God, your confidence in your faith. If your beliefs are unshaken, you have, you have those beliefs. It don't matter what challenges are against you. you you'll be like the singing saints. You say, I know that I know that I know that I know I know. Oh, no, I'm, I know, I know. See, I travel a lot. Pastor, um, uh, Pastor Jason. Uh-oh. Uh-oh. <laughs> Jason and I, we go all over the world together, and I travel a lot. And so one of the, one of the side effects of travel is layovers. And delays. Anybody ever been in a situation that delay your flight, that delay your plane? Okay. Anybody ever delay your Greyhound bus? They delay your trailway bus? <laughs> it's the same thing. Same thing. Y'all gonna act like, nah, I don't never get to fly nowhere. That's cool. I got your trailways. Bro, they, uh, Greyhound. So, but we, we deal with delays a lot. We have a lot of delays. And, and sometimes, what, 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 I've, what I've learned over the years is, whenever they start delaying the flight, chill out. Sit down. Chill out. It, it always amazes me when I, because the little, the little uh, uh, people at the counter, they just, they, they go through so much. I just, I feel bad for them sometimes because people come up there and it's like, I'm going to miss my connection. <laughs> okay, sir, we're doing the best we can. I'll update you as soon as they give us, and I'm waiting on the pilot to give us word, and I will give you word. <sighs> And a few minutes later, they're back at the counter. It's like, you haven't found out anything yet? What am I going to do? It's, well, sir, if you miss your connection, I promise you, we will book you on another flight. We will get you there. And so they get angry. They get really belligerent and sometimes even mad. And sometimes, you know, they get mad. And I look out the window, and I'm looking at the lightning. And then I'm looking at them like, you know, and I... I try to stay in my lane. I try to stay out, my, out their business. But I sure want to bring them over to the window sometimes and say, hey, bro, come in. Let me show you something. You see all that? One day we were getting on a plane, mechanical error, and they said, we tell you something 30 minutes. We tell you something 30 minutes. Tell something. They did it about four or five times until we finally sit there. Now, now I've gotten to the point where they tell, me, they tell me that three times I'm in a hotel room somewhere close. No, 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 no. I, I hear the Lord. And he says, be still and try it again tomorrow. And so this time we got on the plane. We finally made it on the plane. We're sitting on the plane and somebody asked, well, what was the, what was the hold up? What was the problem? And the guy got on the intercom and he says, I'm so sorry. When we were about to take off, the mechanic came and he checked the tires in a routine uh, check. And he found out that both of the tires were set to blow. So they had to change the tires on the whole plane. And so all I could say was, thank you, Jesus. So you might not understand why you're delayed. 
but you have to know that God's doing some stuff that you may not know he's doing to get you ready for your destination it's not that you won't get there you just may not get there when you think you should get there but thank God for the delays because the delays give you opportunity to know that God is just working some things out to make my ride smoother so that when I come down and when I land, it's smooth sailing. Are y'all with me? You got to have your composure. You got to keep your confidence. If God said you're going to have it, you're going to have it. If God said you can do it, you can do it. I was how old, mama? 12, 12, 13 years old. I was watching the Cell Awards. It was in my mama's bedroom in Pine Bluff, Arkansas, I remember. Watching the Cell Awards. And I was like, oh, I love this. I said, mama, when I win my first award, I'm going to give it to you. Now, most people would have dismissed that as a child's frivolous conversation. But God had told me when I was a kid what I was going to do. And there was nobody that could convince me I wasn't going to do what God says I'm going to do. People would try to make me think I was crazy, and I would look at them like, what's wrong with you? You didn't hear? He didn't tell you? Oh, I'm going to do that. So I was 29 years old. That was about 12 or 13. 29 years old. So it didn't happen quick. Didn't happen when I wanted it to happen. Didn't happen at the day that I thought it would have happened in the season of life. I thought it would have happened. But when it did happen, 29 years old, when, I, when my mama went to her mailbox on Mother's Day and opened up her Mother's Day card, there was a box that had my first Stella Award in it that I gave to my mama like I told her. When, I, when God tells you that you're going to have it, that you're going to do it. You got to have the confidence that says, I don't know what I got to go through. I don't know how long it's going to take. I don't know how he's going to do it. But if God told me it's going to happen, I'm going to sit back and chill for this delay is not a denial. It's just getting stuff ready so that when I get it, I'll get it the right way. Are y'all with me? So let's talk about Paul and I got to quit. I'm out of time. Here's the thing with Paul. Paul Paul had something that many of us need to have. I've been on subways. Y'all, y'all been on, anybody ever been on the subway trains or the, or, or the trains at the, tra- at, the, at the airport? So when I go to the airport, some train station, I mean, some airports have train stations, and basically, in order to get from one terminal to another, you got to get on the train. Well, every now and then, you get on the train, and you got a lot of people hoarding around you. And so they, there's no ropes to grab, nothing to hold on to. And, and then the, the pole, they'll be so wrapped around the pole, they don't care whether you fall or go flying or not. They just sit there and wrap around the pole. And so, you know, me being so big, I've had to learn ways <laughs> to navigate this terrain. So I, I figured out that if I, if I square my feet and I move my body weight against the, the, uh, the, the, the train's movement. So if the train is taking off, I just lean the other way. But I have to square my feet and get my footing. Paul and the rest of the disciples were on the ship in the middle of what they call a Eurachlodon. It was the greatest storm that they could ever encounter at sea. It was the equivalent of hurricane strength wind. It was called a nor'easter or a Eurachlodon. This was such a ferocious and terrible storm that it would sometimes instantly break ships apart because the wind was so strong that they couldn't even keep the ship's composure. Things had gotten so bad that after 14 days, they started throwing stuff overboard. 14 days, they, they lived with their lives in, hanging in the balance. They were trying to figure out what are we going to do? How are we going to get out of this? How, how can we make it? And they finally got to the point where 14 days later, they said, look, this thing ain't breaking. It's not giving. We've been tossed about. We've tossed everything out to try to create more buoyancy. We've taken off the mass. We've thrown things overboard. The Bible says that they did things with their hands, which gave an indication that some of the stuff that they had to throw overboard was heavy. And so it literally was a deadly situation that they had been in for 14 days, which probably seemed like four months. You know, when you're in a storm, a minute can seem like an hour. An hour can seem like a whole day. So can you imagine 14 days of wondering, is this it? To finally they got to the point where they they resolved in themselves, they said, listen, we're not going to make it. But 
in the middle of that, I can only imagine that everybody else was in a panic. Everybody else was in a tizzy. They were trying to figure out how we're going to make it, how we're going to make it, until they probably collapsed because they hadn't eaten in the 14 days. They probably collapsed and fainted and, and became weak and weary. Because Paul was a believer, because Paul was God's man, because Paul was sent by God, and because he was a preacher and had a relationship with God, I can imagine that Paul was probably, while they were panicking, Paul was probably praying. And so in the middle of his prayer, Paul decided, I need to do something. So Paul did something that we all need to learn how to do. Whenever you get ready to stabilize yourself in the storm, notice what Paul did. He had the proper position. He stood up. Whenever you're going through a storm, if you want to stabilize yourself, you can't lay down and wallow in your pity. You can't have a pity party and have a woe is me moment. You can't roll around and embrace the pain and, oh my God, I'm never going to be able to make it. You can't sit there and rehearse your struggle, but you got to shake it off, square your shoulders, and you got to learn how to brace yourself and stand up. The only reason Paul was able to stand up is because Paul had first been on his knees. You got to imagine that Paul went into prayer and whenever you go into prayer, God will speak to you and he'll send an angel to stand beside you and give you strength to stand up. What am I standing on? You got to stand on every word that proceeded out of the mouth of God. You got to hold fast to the confession for, for, for your hope without wavering for he who promised is faithful to perform what he has promised to do. You've got to stand on the voice that goes against the wind. You've got to stand in spite of. You've got to stand on the voice that says, don't worry about this. I'm in control of this. And if you don't believe me, just look at the biblical record. I stepped out on the bow of a ship, took authority over the wind and the waves. I spoke to it, opened my mouth. And the authority of my very nature, the essence of my being was so powerful that even the elements had to bow down and ask, how may we serve thee? And I just said, peace be still. So you got to stand on the fact that your God is in control of the storm. Stand for God and watch him stand for you. You got to be steadfast, unmovable, always abounding in the work of the Lord. You got to stand and know that when you're standing for God, God is like, I got this now. All I needed was your faith. Now that you had a little bit of faith and you stood on your faith, watch me work. This battle don't belong to you no way. Get out the way. I've already provided you the victory. Victory is already in your hands. You can go in and start shouting now because I'm about to show you that while you were trying to work, it out I had already stepped through eternity and I figured it out from the end time to the beginning time Paul stood on the words that God had given him and Paul was unshakable well pastor what made Paul so unshakable I'm so glad you asked you asked great questions here's what Paul realized he realized first of all that the storm was of no fault of his own Remember the first thing that Paul said is, I told y'all, I tried to tell y'all, I told y'all before we left Crete, before you untied the ship, that this was going to happen. So Paul recognized that even though I tried to tell them and stop them, the storm that they're in, I'm in it with them. Some of you would have been angry and mad, why I got to go through this? I'm the one that's doing good. I'm the one that's worshiping God. I keep showing up at church. They ain't coming. I'm the one that's praying. I'm doing the righteous acts. I'm doing what God instructed me to do. Why I got to go to the storm? Because they going through the storm. But Paul didn't complain because Paul realized it's not my fault. But whatever God is doing, he's doing it and he needs to get the glory out of my life in it. Romans 8 and 18, I consider that our present suffering is not worthy to be compared to the glory that shall be revealed. He realized that it don't matter what I'm suffering through right now, there's a season coming when God's going to turn this thing around and he's going to get glory out of it. So whatever you're wrestling with, whatever you're going through, whatever you're dealing with, I need you to understand it's bigger than you. It's for his glory. But it looked like he's not going to make it. It looked like, well, I'm not going to be able to get out of this. Don't, don't worry about that because here's the bottom line. God is going to flip that thing around. And when he flips it around, the very people that thought you wouldn't make it, the people that needed the, the lesson of your life, the people that needed your testimony, they're going to have exactly what, you, what God said they're going to have and needed them to have. The other thing that Paul realized is that the Lord was with him in the storm. Paul wasn't sweating because he said the angel of the Lord stood beside me last night. And he gave him this divine prof prophetic word. He says, you will survive. Don't worry about it. You will 
survive. I know it's dark. It don't make sense. I know it looks like you're not going to make it. You will survive. See, whenever you have confidence and you become unshakable, you can hear what God is saying. The problem is you got so much noise and distractions that you can't even hear that God has been trying to tell you through the whole storm, you will survive. And how do you get to the point where you're able to receive this word in your life? Here it is. You got to turn around and take inventory of everything that God has already done and what he already kept you through and how he already delivered you from the hand of the enemy so you stop and you look at what God has done and it gives you cause to pause and praise God for everything that he's already done okay some of y'all might need 10 seconds for that here it is one two three four five six seven eight nine ten now let me help you take it a step further. After you take inventory of the things that he has kept you through, that he has done in your life, and you give God glory and praise for those things, I don't want you to miss this. When Job's life was attacked, you got to note that the enemy went to God, and God says, I'm going to lift the divine protection order, the restraining order that I have on his life, but I'm going to give you parameters. You cannot touch, you can touch everything but you cannot kill Job you can touch his job you can mess with his money you can mess with his marriage but you cannot take his life let me tell you why that excited me because even though the enemy came and got permission for God to lift the restraining order on my life the first thing that I got excited about is to know that God has a divine order of protection and the devil can't do just what he wants to do which is steal kill and destroy the second thing I got excited about is that because he lifted the divine restriction order the divine protection order he did not lift all the parameters so there were some things that he still could not do even though he wanted to do everything that he wanted to do and could do to kill, steal and destroy God put stipulations on it you can attack him but only to this level this is why I got excited because I thank God for everything that I could see but there was some stuff that God kept me from some plots and some plans that the enemy had against me that I didn't even realize were coming my way but God blocked it the enemy came to destroy me and he ran up on grace the enemy came to destroy me and he ran up on mercy the enemy came to take me out and he ran over my favor because God put some stuff around me to protect me and shield me you can attack him but you can't kill him he's a keeper he's a keeper the old people said it like this he protect me from danger seen unseen it's some stuff that you didn't even know would have wiped you out you would have been crazy just by seeing it you would have been cuckoo just by knowing that it was being formed against you but God blocked it and shielded you from it so you don't just thank him for what he has done that you can see but you got to learn how to bless God that he blocked some stuff you couldn't even the Lord was with Paul in the storm and he says, you will survive. You will. How do you know? Because he's a keeper. He's a keeper. He kept me when I couldn't even keep myself. He kept me from stuff I didn't even know was coming. I should have been. I would have been. Some of y'all acting like you're brand new, but I could have been. Don't let the smooth taste fool you, hear? If it had not been. If it had not been. For God's grace and God's mercy, some stuff would have taken me out of here a long time ago. But God stood in the way and said, no, you can't kill him because I got use for him. He's a keeper he's a keeper he is a keeper and so Paul was able to make it because he was in the storm with him Paul also was able 
to be unshaken, resolved, resolute, confidence, confident because Paul re realized that it was bigger than him. He says, Paul, you're going to make it. Let me tell you why. Number one, I ain't done with you. Sister, he ain't done with you. Brother, you made it this far because he ain't done with you. The fact that you got out of what you were in, it just means that he ain't done with you. Don't think that God is finished with you. Don't think that he doesn't have use for you. Don't think that he's not going to get the glory out of y'all. It's not over. Forget about your storms. He's not done with you. He told Paul, he said, Paul, I still need you to stand before Caesar. I still need you to stand trial before Caesar. In other words, I still need you to go to the court of Caesar and tell Caesar and tell them about Jesus. So I can't let you die out here because I still got need for you. Somebody has the anointing and the grace that is locked inside of your life. Somebody has need of it. So it's bigger than you. Sometimes I get excited even in the middle of my storms because I realize what God is using me to do is bigger than me. It is good that I have been afflicted. Had I not known to see the goodness of the Lord in the land of the living, I would have fainted. But it's bigger than me. I can't die. God still has use for me. And until he's finished, it don't matter what the devil says. Until God says it's finished, it ain't finished. And if it ain't good, he ain't done. Because all things work together for I can't see the light at the end of the tunnel because you ain't at the end. You're just in the dark section. I'm trying to help y'all. You must bear witness. In other words, I got work. The second thing he said is that you must be cast on a certain island. In other words, you must be shipwrecked. You must lose some relationships. You must go through the storm of loss. You must lose some friendships. You must lose this job. You must lose this. The ship got to go. You won't die. And because you own the ship, none of them going to die either. But you must lose some stuff. You must go through this pain. You must feel this hurt. You must have them betray you and stab you in the back. You must walk through seasons by yourself. You must lose the house. You must lose the car. It's in the way. I can't get glory because you're giving it all to that. You must lose the ship. But the ship is what's carrying me. No, I'm carrying you. I'm going to teach you that I'm carrying you because you ain't going to have nothing but broken pieces. But I'm going to still bring you to the seashore. God's plan for him was, he was instructed on what to do in 27. You will live. He got the prophetic word. But I need you to pay attention to this. Please start playing. I got to quit. I got to go. <laughs> it's just so good in this 10 o'clock service. I don't want to let it go. Play. In, in Acts 27 is when Paul stands up and he becomes unshakable. But watch this. God does not even reveal the purpose behind the storm until chapter 28. In chapter 28, Paul was shipwrecked. He lands on the Isle of Melita. And when he gets to this island, the islanders are so nice to him and they treat him well. And Paul was picking up wood and threw the wood on the fire and a viper grabbed him. And it was, they knew, the islanders knew, oh, that's a venomous bite. Oh, he dead. He, he out of here. They kept waiting on him to swell up and die. But Paul just shook it off and shook it in the fire. And they waited for hours. Any minute now, he's going to die. Finally, they got to a point where they waited a long time and said, he ain't dying. He must be a God. That was an opportunity for Paul to witness and say, no, I'm not a God. It's not I, but it's the Christ that lives in me. So they were converted. Then they let Paul, they let Paul stay at the chief official on the island. They let him stay in Publius's house. And when he got to Publius' house, he found out that Publius' dad was sick. He said, take me in the room where he is, because he was an elder. So as an elder, he called for the elder, and he laid hands on him and had a prayer meeting. And the man's 
father was healed. Publius, the chief official on the island, he got converted. Then everybody who was sick on the island said he did what? So now he had an all night prayer vigil. Because all the sick people were lined up and he laid hands on all of them and all of them were healed. So they got converted. Then he finally made it to the court of Caesar. Three months later, he got in the court of Caesar and they were, he said, I need to tell you about what, what I was teaching. They said, tell us what you were teaching. We want to know why they accused you. He started teaching and many of them were converted that day. And some of them got mad and walked out. So many of the people who were in the top tier of leadership, many of the, congr the congressmen and senators, they became believers, believers and they got converted. Then he stayed there in that, on that island. He stayed in Rome for two more years. And in the two years that he stayed there, people came through his house all the time. And if, if they came to his house, he would open his doors and just teach them about Jesus. So many of them got converted. God didn't even tell him why he had to go through the storm and was shipwrecked. Why he couldn't make it to where they were trying to go. Why he had to stop at that island. He didn't even tell him until chapter 28. So it means that you might not know what God is doing in this season. You might not understand why it looks like it looks in this chapter. But if you square your shoulders... Stand on the promises and the word of God. Believe the divine decree that you shall live. When you get to the next chapter, God's going to reveal why you had to go through what you went through. Why you had to deal with and endure what you went through. You just got to be faithful enough to make it to the next chapter. I need all the unshakable saints. Don't wait till you see it. But praise God for what he's about to do in your life. Come on, you can do better than that. Come on, I want you to really praise him this time. You're still playing with it, but I need you to praise him. Come on, tell the devil I'm unshakable. I still got my praise. Still got my joy. I still got my worship.